the chapters we have been in lately, we've called uh, the farewell, Jesus' farewell, and he's been uh, predominantly just focusing on teaching, teaching his disciples to prepare them for life without Jesus, because uh, they, they've been with him for three and a half years, and then Jesus is going to go to the cross. He's going to die. He's going to rise again. He's going to ascend to the Father. And so how will the disciples carry on without him? And that's really been the focus of the study. This has been the focus of what Jesus is, is teaching them, that he is not going to leave them alone, but that it's in fact better if he goes away because he's promising them the Holy Spirit, the helper, uh, to come and to indwell them and to give them power going forward. And last week, we really built up to this. We looked at the actual work of the Holy Spirit. Um, prior to this, he just promised the Holy Spirit. He, he taught about it with an illustration with the vine and the branches, meaning how important it is that they stay uh, at, for a branch to be vibrant and fruit-bearing. It needs to abide in the vine. And so how important it was for them to have the Holy Spirit so that they can produce the fruitful works of ministry that he's called them to do. And last week, we looked at a very, very important passage. The first section of chapter 16 looks at the work of the Holy Spirit in two areas. Uh, First, we looked at the Holy Spirit's work in the world, that the Holy Spirit comes and indwells believers because he has a ministry to the lost in the world. And the first point we looked at was that he is here to testify of Christ. Largely, the Holy Spirit does that through us, how we live our lives, Um, how we're faithful to live out the gospel. The Holy Spirit through us testifies to the lost in this world. And then through that testimony has the second um, role, and that is to convict the hearts, to convict the hearts of men uh, of their, their sin and need for righteousness, the righteousness of Christ. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. Like that, that the pressure is not on us. We don't have to convert anybody. The Holy Spirit does the work of convicting. The second thing we looked at last week was the Holy Spirit's work in believers. So how does he work in us? What's he he doing for us now? If if you've been with us, we, we, we looked at the primary role of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer is to make you aware of the abiding presence of Christ. That is what Jesus wanted his disciples to know. I'm going away, but I'm not going away. I'm going away, but I'm not leaving you orphans. He's said those things several times because he wants them to know they won't be alone. And that's what Christ wants you to know today. You're you're not alone. He is with you. That's the primary role. But what are some functions? What does the Holy Spirit do in the life of the believer? We looked at two things last week. One, he'll guide you into all truth. You have a resident truth teacher, and that truth teacher guides you into truth. As you read Scripture, the Holy Spirit illuminates truth to you. It's why I pray every every day for the Spirit's illumination when we study Scripture, because that's the role of the Spirit in the life of the believer. The second thing we looked at is that the Holy Spirit is here to glorify Christ. And we talked about that, that if the Holy Spirit is glorifying the Holy Spirit, or if the Holy Spirit is glorifying you, it may not be the Holy Spirit, because that's not why the Holy Spirit is here. The Holy Spirit's here to glorify Christ, and that's the other role. And these are amazing truths. These are incredible things. And remember, Jesus is trying to um, comfort the disciples in the, the wake of his truth bomb that he is going to leave them alone. Um, the disciples are receiving these truths, and by extension, us, all believers, right? And as we continue the Lord's mission to the lost world, we are confident that we're not doing it alone. That's what he wants you to to know. And while the work of the Holy Spirit to the world and to us is, is helpful to know, it may not be necessarily comforting. It may not be the thing that just brings you a comfort, specifically for the disciples, I would imagine. I, I would imagine that they still really don't understand Jesus leaving, and how all that's going to work. And yes, Jesus told them that he would abide in them through the Holy Spirit, but at this point, they can't really comprehend what effect that would have on their sorrow, because they are sorrowful. If you look at verse 6 of chapter 16, we looked at this last week, Jesus said, but because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. They're sad. They're, 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 really broken over the fact that Jesus is going to leave them, and they can't see how anything else can really comfort them. 
And so Jesus wants to give a little more instruction regarding their sorrow. They will have real sorrow. He's very frank and upfront about that, but they would see it turn into joy. Now, that's a very strange thing to say, right? I'm going to leave you, and I know you're going to be sad about it, but it, that's going to turn into joy um, because I'm sending the Holy Spirit to you. That's the, the idea. It seems like a, 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 a pale substitute. I remember when I was dating my, my wife, she moved to Chicago, which is a long ways away from California. I don't know if you know the geography of the States, but it's not next door, right? It would take me many, many days to drive from California to Chicago. I had a picture of her, but it wasn't the same as having her, right? I didn't go like, ah, I feel so comforted now. Jody is with me. She wasn't with me. It was a, it was a photograph, right? It was a pale comparison. It was not a good substitute. I would rather Jody be with me. I think by the same kind of comparison, the whole, you know, the Holy Spirit's coming to us. What's that even like? How's that going to, how's that going to be the same as Jesus, right? It's not very comforting to the disciples, but Jesus is trying to teach them through this. The sorrow they will experience, it will be real. In fact, it's going to even get worse, but it's going to be short-lived. And he's trying to broaden their minds and understanding in terms of how the Holy Spirit is going to uh, be able to work in them in such a way that that sorrow can turn to joy. So let's read the passage today. We're looking at verses 16 to 24. John chapter 16, verses 16 to 24. A little while, and you will not see me. And again, a little while, and you will see me, because I go to the Father. Then some of his disciples said among themselves, what is this that he says to us a little while and you will not see me? And again, a little while and you will see me. And because I go to the father, they said, therefore, what is this that he says a little while? We do not know what he is saying. Now, Jesus knew that they desired to ask him. And he said to them, are you inquiring among yourselves about what I said? A little while and you will not see me. And again, a little while and you will see me. Most assuredly, I say to you that you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. And you will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned into joy. A woman, when she is in labor, has sorrow because her hour has come. But as soon as she has given birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. Therefore, you now have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart will rejoice, and your joy no one will take from you. And in that day, you will ask me nothing. Most assuredly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive that your joy may be full. Let me pray. God, I pray for our time now in your word. We do pray, Lord, that you would reveal these truths to us through your spirit, Lord amazing truths, Lord, that it doesn't matter what takes place in our lives. You are guaranteeing joy, full joy. And I pray, Lord, you'd help us to see how that can be true of us today. Open our hearts for what you want to teach us, we pray for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, well, I've made a little outline that um, I've included in my slides at the request of my wife. Um, Sometimes I speak a little fast, and I don't always have outlines. I don't always speak in terms of outlines, but I might say, oh, of one point or two points, and, and then she's just writing one, and I'm already on to two. So uh, I'm, I've included them up here for you today. If you're a note taker and you like outlines, I do have one today. We're going to look at first the uh, prediction of the Lord, and, um, and, and I'll have them come through on the slides as we get through them. The prediction of the Lord here is in verse 16. He says, a little while, and you will not see me. And again, a little while, and you will see me because I go to the Father. And this prediction is not easy to understand. I'm going to tell you at the beginning, it's difficult. It's difficult because we have to rightly interpret what Jesus means by a little while. A little while. Because a little while can mean a lot of different things, right? You guys love to say, oh, just a sec here, or three secs. Or you say something like that. And minutes go by. There's nothing close to a sec. I'm sorry. Or just a tick, right? No, there's many ticks. <laughs> I, I'm waiting a long time for, uh, for help. What does Jesus mean by a little while? Just a sec? What's a little while mean? 
I think it's important for us to kind of look at how John has used this before because it's not the first time Jesus has used that phrase and it's very helpful. It's very helpful. Turn back to John chapter 7, verse 33. John chapter 7, verse 33. Jesus used this phrase. John chapter 7, verse 33. Then Jesus said to them, I shall be with you a little while longer and then I go to him who sent me. Okay? So I'll be with you a little while longer, and then I go to him who sent me. He's going to go to the Father. So he's talking about a long way off here because when does this take place? This takes place, if you recall, during the Feast of Tabernacles. The Feast of Tabernacles took place in autumn, September, October time frame there, which would be several months away from his, his death at Passover and then the 40 days, right, and, and his, his ascension. Um, so you're talking about a little while, meaning months, Okay, it's probably what you more all mean when you say, oh, just a sec, I don't know. Um, but John chapter 7, verse 33, a little while is a long time in, 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 in perspective. But then you go to John chapter 12. John chapter 12, verse 35. He's used it again here. John chapter 12, verse 35. Then Jesus said to them, a little while longer, the light is with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. He who walks in darkness does not know where he is going. So here he uses it again. He says a little while longer, and the light's going to leave. Who's the light? Jesus. Jesus is the light that's come into the world. That goes all the way back to chapter 1, right? He's the light, and a little while longer, that light's going to leave. So walk while you have the light, he says. What's a little while longer here? Well, Jesus says this after the triumphal entry during Passover, So his a little while longer here is now maybe days away. So we've gone sort of from months now to to, to, to days here. And here in our passage in John chapter 16, when he says, a little while and you will not see me, uh, they're not going to see him because he's, he's, he's going to obviously die on the cross. But does it mean more than that? Does it stop there? Because he says, and again, a little while, and you will see me. What does he talk about between these two little whiles? Now, commentators disagree on this, and that's why I'm, I'm taking a moment to talk about it, because I think if we really look at everything, it, it comes a little bit more uh, clearly what he's talking about. There's really three possibilities. What, what's the difference between the two little whiles? Well, one possibility is Jesus is referring to the three days, right? His death, the three days in the tomb, his resurrection. So meaning a little while and you won't see me because I'm going to die. I'm going to be buried. And then a little while and you will see me because I'll rise, right? Some people think that's, that's the, the meaning um, there. But what that does is it limits the little while to just Jesus' death on the, the cross, which hasn't been the point up to this point at all. When he said it back in chapter 7, he says, a little while and you won't see me. Why? Because I'm going to the Father. A little while and you won't see me. Why? Because I'm the light in the world and the light's going to be taken out of the world permanently, not just for three days. You see what I'm saying? It's a limiting thing that hasn't been done yet up to this point. And it also doesn't seem to address, uh, Jesus doesn't seem to address the fact that he's going to the cross in this entire upper room thing. When he's talking to his disciples and saying, I'm going away, he's actually talking about going to the Father. He's looking past the cross. He's looking to his glorification. Look at John chapter 13, verse 31. Two places that he's mentioned this. John 13, 31. So when he had gone out, Jesus said, now the son of man is glorified and God is glorified in him. This is right after um, Judas has left the upper room. So Jesus is left with his his 11 disciples, the faithful disciples, the true ones. And he says, uh, now the son of man is going to be glorified. Well, we know the next thing that's going to happen. He's going to die on the cross. But Jesus is looking past the cross. He's looking to his glorification, returning to his father in heaven. And that's why he says in chapter 14, verse 28, these words to his disciples. You've heard me say to you, I'm going away and I'm coming back to you. If you loved me, you would rejoice because I said, I'm going to the Father, for my Father is greater than I. Jesus is saying, you really should be excited because I'm done my mission. I'm going to the Father. The Father's greater. I've humbled myself and become a man. 
right? That's his point. He's looking past the cross. So I think this interpretation limits his time with them. Um, it limits the first after a little while to the um, cross. And then it limits his time after because he's going to rise and he'll be with them only 40 days, right? A little while and you will see me, but uh, you only see me for 40 days and uh, then I'm gone again, right? He, does, he doesn't say that. So I don't think the first possibility is the best. The second one is people think he's referring to his second coming, right? When he returns um, right before, right at the end of the tribulation, right before the millennial uh, kingdom. So if you look at that, that little while has actually been stretched into a very long while, 2,000 years and counting, right? He's not going to return for many, many, many years. And why would people connect that? Well, they do it because they connect his illustration we read, read here in verse 21 of a woman in labor. They connect that to the birth pains Jesus talks about in Matthew 24. If you remember that, in Matthew 24, verse 8, he says, all these are the beginning of sorrows, or birth pains is the word. So they connect those two things as, oh, this must be what he's talking about. But the um, two analogies are speaking of different truths. The birth pains in Matthew 24 are all these cataclysmic events that are set to take place, right? All over, the, all over the world. And it's the great tribulation that precedes his second coming. Um, and the analogy in this passage here about the woman in labor is used entirely different. It's used to illustrate that something that's initially meant to bring, or initially bring sorrow can ultimately bring joy. The analogies are, uh, you know, they're completely different analogies. So I don't think that's the best one either. I think option three is the best option. That's this. Jesus is referring to the coming of the Holy Spirit. Now, I know it doesn't seem like it's the clearest one, but if you've seen what Jesus has been talking about up to this point, it is because he's been telling them that he's going away, but he's going to return. Um, he says, you won't see me, right? In this passage, you will not uh, see me. In fact, the ESV translates it, you will see me no longer, meaning no more. So if it's just three days, they will see him, won't they? Pretty quickly, actually. Um, he's spoken to them in this mysterious way several times. Look at chapter 14 and look at verse 16. This is when he's praying about the Holy Spirit coming. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that's the Holy Spirit, that he may abide with you forever, the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. A little while longer, there's the little while again, and the world will see me no more, but you will see me because I live, you will live also. Now it was confusing, but we looked at this before. On the one hand, he says, um, I'm going to pray that the spirit of truth comes, right? That the Holy Spirit uh, comes and he'll dwell with you. I'm not going to leave you orphans. I'm going to come to you. So the Holy Spirit's going to come to you. I'm going to come to you, right? Uh, a little while longer. You won't see me anymore, but you will see me. And then Jesus has been teaching in that sort of enigmatic way, right? Kind of confusing. He's coming to them because the Holy Spirit is going to make his presence known. That is what he's talking about. And here's another reason. He can't send the Holy Spirit unless Jesus goes where? To the Father. Back in verse 7 of chapter 16, he said that. Nevertheless, I tell the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. So it seems clear to me by how Jesus has been talking to them and preparing them for the coming of the Holy Spirit, how he's spoken of the Spirit coming and yet him coming at the same time that Jesus is talking about the Holy Spirit here. A little while and you won't see me, meaning he is going to die, be buried, rise and ascend to the Father. They will see him no more. They will see him no more. But a again, a little while and you will see me. How will they see him? Because the Holy Spirit will come and indwell them right? And they will know that Christ is with them. That is the point. But obviously, as it's kind of confusing to us here, and just as it was confusing to um, uh, those that he talked about it in, in chapter 7, it's confusing to the, to the disciples as well. Uh, they, don't, they don't quite get it here, and so they're confused, and that's what they begin to talk about here in verse 17. But here we see the perception of the Lord. That's the prediction of the Lord. This is what's going to take place, but here's the perception of the Lord. Verse 17, 
Then some of his disciples said among themselves, what is this that he says to us? A little while and you will not see me. And again, a little while and you will see me. And because I go to the father, they said, therefore, what is this that he says? A little while. We do not know what he is saying. So they're obviously uh, confused a bit. Now it says in verse 18 that the disciples um, did not know what he is saying. The word know is ido, and it means to understand. John is going to give us a little play on words here a bit. It's, they don't understand. They're, they're confused, and they're so confused, they want to ask him, but they don't ask him. Kind of strange that they don't ask him, right? You think one of them would just raise their hand and go, excuse me, I got a question, Jesus. Could you just clarify um, pretty much everything, All right? Just go, go back and start over, because <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not getting this. Uh, but they don't do it. And I was wondering why. Why don't they, why don't they uh, ask him? I think possibly because of what he said to them in verse 12. He said, I still have many things to say to you, but you can't bear them right now. I think they become so sorrowful. Sorrow has overcome them. Jesus wants to give them more, but they, they literally can't take any more on. And now they're just confused. They're just lost. Uh, they want to ask him, but they, they don't because they just don't think they're going to get it anyway because they're overcome. They're overcome. And so Jesus knew of their confusion. You see that in verse 19. Now Jesus knew that they desired to ask him. Now a different word is used here. It's gnosko, and that means to perceive or to have knowledge of. I think Jesus' perception here is not due so much to his attentiveness because he's so attentive, but it's due to his omniscience. Jesus is God. He's all-knowing. He knows exactly they, the, the reason they're confused. He knows exactly what they need. He knows that they want to ask and they don't. He knows those things, not just because he's with them. We've seen that all through the gospel of John. If, if you go back to John chapter two, I actually have the verse here for you so you don't have to look it up. You might remember this in verses 23 to 25. This is what he said. When, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men. And he had no need that anyone should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. He knew that they didn't really believe in him. They just believed um, the signs and they were kind of, you know, wonder seekers and they were sort of following him superficially. So he didn't commit himself to them. They weren't true followers. How do you know that? He knows, he knows what's in man. He knows man. How can you know man unless you're God? In John chapter 4, we see it again. You might remember the woman at the well, right? And Jesus, Jesus just knows all this stuff about a woman he's never met before. In verses 17 and 18, the woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you have well said, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. <laughs> In that you spoke truly, right? He said, go call your husband. I don't have a husband, right? It's just, you've got this amazing knowledge of Jesus from about someone he never met. And then she goes into the town and tells everybody, come see this man who knows everything about me. In John chapter 6, verse 64, but there are some of you who do not believe, for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who would betray him. He knew from the beginning. He knew who would follow him and who would betray him. He knew Judas was of the devil, he said. And so he knows because he's omniscient. That's a, 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 a characteristic of God. It's an attribute of him because Jesus is God. And so he knew they wanted to ask him his, and, and the meaning, but they wouldn't ask. And so I love Jesus' compassion. He just takes the initiative himself. He's going to kind of seek to answer their unasked asked question. And he, so he does it with a parable. So this is the parable of the Lord. A parable of the Lord here. Look at uh, verse 20. Most assuredly, I say to you that you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice and you will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned into joy. Now, because what Jesus is about to say is so important, he uses that very famous most assuredly phrase. We should know by now, right? The double amen, the truly, truly. That means I'm, a, I'm really about to say something very important. Listen up. <laughs> most assuredly. That's what he means. You will weep and lament but the world will rejoice. What is Jesus referring to? What's the event that's going to take place that will cause the disciples to weep and lament, but the whole world to rejoice? That's the cross, right? They're, 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 they're going to see Jesus die. They'll be sad, but the world will be happy, in, in, in generally speaking, right? That, that's the idea there. 
And the word here used for rejoice is hyro. It's to be glad. It's to rejoice exceedingly. That's the, the, the gladness and joy of the world. We, we see that in the world today, right? People rejoicing over, over, over things. That's a, a natural human joy. But Jesus says that their sorrow will be turned into joy, and a different word is used. It's very close, but it's actually different. It's hyra. It's joy. It's delight. Now, which of those two words, if you could guess, is the one that's the fruit of the Spirit? Hara, right? Yes, the one the disciples are promised. That's the fruit of the Spirit, which is what Jesus is getting at. I know it doesn't sound possible, disciples. You're going to have real sorrow, but you're going to see that sorrow turn into joy, which is one of the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5, joy. But how will that joy come? How will they get it? It's a, is it going to be a separate event that will cause that sorrow to be turned into joy? Something separate than the cross? Well, yes and no, <laughs> if I can answer it that way. Yes and no. The disciples are certainly going to grieve over the death of Jesus on the cross. Absolutely. They love him. They don't want to see him die. But all the sorrow, all the tears, all that fled away at Pentecost, the day when the Holy Spirit was poured out upon them. In fact, Acts 13, 52 tells us, and the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. When you see the disciples in Acts, they're a different bunch of guys. And we've talked about this the last couple of weeks. They're, they're bold, right? They're brave. But we see the description is that they have the Holy Spirit and they have joy. Now, remember, one of the roles of the Holy Spirit is to guide you into truth, right? You have a resident truth teacher. So here, the Holy Spirit is caused them to view, because Jesus is still dead, even though they have the Holy Spirit, right? They're grieving, and they get the Holy Spirit, they're not grieving. Because the Holy Spirit comes in, has, has now changed their perspective about the cross, right? We have the Holy Spirit. We don't grieve over the death of Jesus. We look at the cross with what? Joy, right? We look at it with joy. Why? Because that's the basis of our redemption, and that's what the Holy Spirit did for them. All of a sudden, their eyes are open. Oh, whoa, the cross is an amazing thing. Salvation has come to everyone because of the cross. It's why we can have such joy. Hebrews 9, verse 12, tells us this. Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Every year they had to go and sacrifice those, those animals, right? Every, every single year, because sin still remained. But Jesus did once for all offer the sacrifice so that the redemption is eternal, eternally redeemed. We're purchased, we're saved forever. And that's why we can boast in the cross. That's why you, some of you wear little gold necklaces that have you know, an instrument of torture around you, right? That's what, that's what the cross is, by the way, right? If you wanted to make a modern day one, you can... Put an electric chair there. It's, it's an instrument of death. But we wear it with a different perspective, don't we, right? It's joy. And Paul boasts about the cross all the time. Paul says this in Galatians 6, 14, but God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, right? I'll boast in one thing. I'll boast about the cross. Strange thing to boast about, not for a believer because our, our percep perception is different right? We have a different perspective about the cross. It's the understanding that with the death of Jesus on the cross came redemption. With the ascension of Jesus to the Father comes the Holy Spirit. With the coming of the Holy Spirit comes joy, unending joy, and that's what we see happen to the disciples. And Jesus wants to cement that truth in their minds, and so he tells them this parable. Look what he says in verse 21 again, a woman, when she is in labor, has sorrow because her hour has come. But as soon as she has given birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. Now, this meaning in this passage, is, this parable is pretty clear, isn't it, right? No men should be nodding their head right now. You don't know. <laughs> Just the women, right? Pain in childbirth and then joy. That's what he's talking about. Now, pain in childbirth comes about by the, the curse that we see in Genesis 3, 16, that is a result. That's the aftermath of the, of the fall. But the pain of, of labor and childbirth fades away once that little newborn baby is placed 
in the mother's arms. There's something that just happens there that's uh, incredible. You know, even women who have had horrific experiences of childbirth, I have seen, um, who say, who come out of that saying, never again, right? <laughs> I'm done. Um, they're soon ready to have another. They're soon ready to go back through that experience. Why? Because of the joy that that child brings to their life, right? That joy overcomes the sorrow. Now, the joy that's promised to us through the Holy Spirit is a supernatural joy, right? Because it comes from God. It's a supernatural joy. It doesn't come from any other outside source like the rejoicing uh, of the world. For Jesus to use this analogy here of childbirth to illustrate uh, this, this truth, I think does indicate something about that joy that women have. There's something unique about that. I know that part of that is biological, but there has to be some of that that's supernatural because I could not do that, right? If I gone through the experience like, no, that hurts. I'm done, right? That's just, that's, there's something unique there for women. There is a supernatural joy that has to be present there um, for, for them to go, that is so worth it. How else do you explain the willingness of women to go through that all over again? I think it's quite sad when women forfeit that joy when they forfeit the life of their child through abortion. And I don't seek to condemn anyone today regarding that. If you've had an abortion, Jesus offers forgiveness for that. He does. But he also wants you to know today that if you've done something like that, you have regret, you have sorrow, you have guilt, you have grief, that can be replaced by joy. That's what he's talking about to believers today, right? No matter what sorrow we're going through, what kind of pain, what kind of hardship, the Holy Spirit brings about an unending supernatural joy to us. And that's what he's talking about. Look at verse 22. Therefore, you now have sorrow, but I will see you again and your heart will rejoice and your joy no one will take from you. So again here, as we've seen in verse, in verse 16 and in verse uh, 19, Jesus is talking about seeing them again, isn't he, right? I'll see you again. Uh, I'll see you again. And in here, right, I'll see you again. But what is he talking about? Again, he's talking about the Holy Spirit. It can't just be the 40 days that he's here on earth before he ascends to the Father. That won't be lasting joy. That won't be joy that no one can take from them if it's based upon the fact that Jesus has to be present. He isn't. That's why he promised them the Holy Spirit, because then he is present. He is with them always. He's always with them. It's a permanent, spirit-produced joy. And finally, notice the promise of the Lord in verses 23 and 24. Verse 23, in that day, you will ask me nothing. Most assuredly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. In what day? In what day? He says, in, in that day. What day is he, is he talking about? He's talking about some time frame, some period. When is that? Well, it's the day mentioned above, the day when they'll see the Lord again. Uh, when will that be? That will be um, the coming of the, uh, the Holy Spirit. I don't think that it means the resurrection for all the reasons I've said, because that's going to be a temporary time that Jesus is there. In fact, if you look at verse 16 again, that second little while and again a little while and you will see me, why will they see him? Because he goes to the Father. <laughs> and you will see me, why? Because I go to the Father. How can they see him if he's with the Father? Because he goes to the Father, he can send the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes because he goes to the Father. On that day, you're going to see me. On that day, the day of Pentecost, you're going to understand. You're going to realize and that's what Luke records here for us in Acts chapter 1. If you want to just briefly look at Acts chapter 1, we see, we see some of this here. Here's Jesus. He's, he's resurrected from the, the, the dead. He's with the disciples, right? And it says this, The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up, after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles, whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. 
So he's been with them for 40 days. He's been teaching them, speaking about things pertaining to the kingdom of God because he's been with them. But the Holy Spirit's going to be the one that's going to come and teach them. And look, they ask a question in verse 6. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? But in our passage, Jesus said, in that day, you will ask me nothing. You can't be talking about the time that they have with Jesus during those 40 days. You're not going to need to ask me anything. First of all, you can't. I won't be here. But the Holy Spirit will teach you everything. That's the point. The Holy Spirit will come, guide them into truth, and teach them everything. We looked at this verse last week, but it's a good one, verse John 2, 27, that explains what, what takes place here. But the anointing which you have received from him abides in you, and you do not need that anyone teach you. But as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things, and is true, and is not a lie, and just at, as it has taught you, you will abide in him. They won't need to ask Jesus anything because the Holy Spirit will teach them concerning all things. And then for the second time in this passage, Jesus introduces another important truth by using the same double amen, most assuredly. So two really important truths coming here from Jesus. Most assuredly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Now, this is so important. Um, John has mentioned it three times. In this whole discussion with his disciples, three times Jesus has uh, talked about um, asking whatever you wish in the name of the Father. The first time was John 14, 13. I have it for you here. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. And then the second time was in John 15, 16. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. So two times he said the similar thing. And here he says it again, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Now we briefly covered this, but I want to take a little bit more time today because I think really this is, this is Jesus' main point. And I mentioned this part before, because we pray in Jesus' name, it's not a magical formula for ensuring success in our prayers, right? I think a lot of times we just do it, do it by habit. Um, but let me just tell you, you don't have to say, and in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Um, for God to hear your prayer. If you one time prayed and forgot to say in Jesus' name, you're right, you're like, oh, I didn't say it, oh, I didn't say it in Jesus' name. I'm gonna, oh, well, there that goes. I have to give another crack later, right? That's not, that's not what God's going for. We're not to have to say things in a certain way or God will hear us. It's heart, right? What's the point here? Three times he said it. You gotta ask in my name and he'll give it to you. Ask in my name, he'll give it to you. Ask in my name and he'll give you whatever you want. So then we can just go, okay, whatever I want, in Jesus' name, name it and claim it, right? That's, but that's where people go today, don't they? Ask whatever you want, and he'll give it to you. You just make sure you say it in Jesus' name. A couple of things. Here's what it means. It means you need to make requests that are consistent with God's will. You might say, and try to support from Scripture, but it's God's uh, will, that um, I live life to the fullest, right? You might look at yourself like, I'm supposed to be that. I'm a child of the king, however, right? You might, I, so he wants me to be happy. He wants me to be rich. He wants me to be wealthy. He wants me to be healthy. He wants all those things of me. Um, I, I, I don't see Jesus saying that to them. No, you're going to sorrow. <laughs> you're going to weep. You're going to lament. And the world is going to rejoice in all of that. That's, that's Jesus' news, <laughs> right? But your sorrow will be turned into joy. Why? Because you just can magically make it go away by saying a magic prayer? No, it's not what Jesus is saying. We pray in accordance with God's will. The disciples are left for a particular mission, and they want to accomplish that mission, the same mission that Christ has. That's why he says, I'm coming to you. You're going to continue to fulfill my mission to the world. And if that's really our goal as Christians, then we're going to pray for things that are consistent with that. That's what we're going to pray for. Lord, I want to see the salvation come to these people. Would you, would you bless our efforts there, right? I, I, I want to see these people minister to who are lacking these things. Would you help us do that? Paul, if you read Paul, Paul prays for those things, right? Lord, bring me to Rome because I've got this gift, right? I, uh, bring me to, to Jerusalem. I want to get this gift, right? They've given this you know, Gentile contribution. I want to get it there. 
I want them to know the love that the saints have for them, right? I want to fellowship with them. He wants them to see those things. Why? Because he's selfish? No, those are eternal things, right? He's praying for the mission of, of the Lord to be fulfilled. In 1 John 5, 14, he says, now this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. It's according to his will. It's what Jesus taught in that Lord's prayer, right? Your kingdom come, your will be done. It's, it's wanting uh, his kingdom first before all things. Another thing is what it means. It means acknowledging your utter dependence on him to supply all of your needs um, and, and not rely on your own resources. Philippians 4, 19, and my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Now, God does that in many ways. Sometimes he does that through people, right? Through the church, through, through his people. Like a lot of times your needs are met uh, because of the unity and love and fellowship that's happening in the body of believers, right? Uh, that, that's how he meets those needs, right? You, you, you could really desperately be needing something and, and have that need met by someone in the, in, the, in, in the church, right? And then you could directly go to God and say, God, thank you for meeting my need. Why? That was him answering your prayer, right? That's how he does that. It's consistent there. Also, I think it means expressing a desire that God would be glorified in how he answers. You want him, ultimately, you want him to be glorified. That's what he talks about in John 14, right? That you be glorified through this. Pray, pray that you be glorified through these things. And the kind of prayer that the disciples are supposed to pray here is brand new. This has never happened to before. Look at verse 24. Until now, you've asked nothing in my name. They haven't had to. They've had Jesus there, right? They had questions. They just asked him. They had needs. They just asked him, right? Um, they, they didn't need to. Until now, they have not ever done that. In fact, they probably only ever prayed to the Father. But now I need you to know that you're going to have to pray in, in my name, that you're going to continue on the mission of of me, right? My mission. That's it. They've never had to do it this way before. But this is what God wants for his new church age going forward. This is how he wants us to function, recognizing that it's through Christ and what he's done um, and through the indwelling Holy Spirit. It's answered prayer that's based upon the finished work of Christ that springs from an obedient life that acknowledges our dependence upon him whose sole purpose is to bring him glory. That's the kind of prayer we're to offer. And look at what it promises us in verse 24. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. Now, I think this is really, really important. The word, the word full there, by the way, is plerao. It means to make full, uh, to cause to abound, but also to, to render complete, to fulfill. Jesus used the same word back in chapter uh, 15, verse 11. He said, this, these things I've spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. Same word there. I think the promise Jesus makes to his disciples regarding joy becomes um, fulfilled. It becomes complete when? When we receive answer to prayer. Because that's evidence that God is working in us. David was really joyful today, sharing in prayer meeting today because a prayer was answered, right? They, been, they had a, an answer to prayer, which even from the perspective that he, he shared it, instantly brought glory to God because they, we're going to pray for you in this, and then the prayer was answered. It wasn't, it wasn't because we're so holy and we pray. It was because God is a faithful God and he can answer prayer. But a lot of times, I think Christians have difficulty with prayer or maybe even seeing answer to prayer. Why is that? I think it's very simple. I think we often don't pray the way we should. I mean, honestly, I think a lot of times we, we, we don't really fully know God and, and his mission and plans and purposes for us. And so we tend to sort of just kind of scale everything down to our own needs. A group of, of, of men were meeting and, and going through a book called The Prayers of Paul. And we're reading through his prayers and being challenged by how Paul prayed. And here's just something from the introduction of that book about why he wrote it. It's by D.A. Carson, if you want to look it up. But he says... The main problem is that people don't really know God in, in terms of, you know, what he wants. It says this, when it comes to knowing God, many of us constitute a culture of the spiritually stunted. So much of our religion is packaged to address our felt needs. And these are almost uniformly anchored in our pursuit of happiness and fulfillment, 
without rightly understanding where true happiness and fulfillment lie. God becomes the great being who, potentially at least, meets our needs and fulfills our aspirations. We think too little of what he is like, of his wisdom, his knowledge, power, love, transcendence, mystery, and glory. We're not intoxicated by his holiness and his love. His thoughts and words capture too little of our imagination, too little of our discourse, too few of our priorities. Many of our religious exercises and verbal expressions feel painfully unreal, inauthentic, merely formulaic. It's challenging. It's challenging. How do we know God more? How can we understand what he wants from us more? That's what Jesus is trying to teach them. You're not going to have to try to figure all that out. I'm giving you my spirit. He's in you, right? And as we saw last week, how does the Holy Spirit teach you? Through his word. If you struggle in prayer and in those areas, I just challenge you, just get into God's word. Begin to, to just really soak it up and see what does he want from me? And, and as you read the prayers of Paul, even as I read, he was constantly praying for the ministry, right? It doesn't mean he never prayed for himself, right? He, he, he'd never, you know, um, uh, you know, focus on himself in certain needs. He certainly did. He said, I'll oh, pray for me so that those, those guys in Judea that don't like me won't kill me. But why do you pray for that? He prayed so that he could come there and share the gospel, right? It wasn't because he feared death. He didn't. He wanted to complete his mission. So much of our prayers, a lot of times, are just focused on the little things that revolve around our own little world, and they've got to go beyond that, and that's what he's telling them. In fact, what he says here is that your joy will be full. It'll be complete. Here's my point. I think Jesus is saying, you want to see real, unending joy that is actually fully fulfilled? It's when you're praying in the, the, you know, the ministry that God has called you to. You're praying to see fulfillment there. You'll see answer to that prayer, and that will bring real joy. You'll be, wow, God is really doing these, these things. It's incredible. Well, just a couple of closing thoughts. I wanted to take you to uh, Hebrews chapter 12. I read this at the beginning here. I told you we'd come back to it. Just a closing thought really regarding this. Hebrews chapter 12. Just look at these first two verses and then we'll close. says this, this is just coming on the heels of, of the great, you know, hall of faith chapter, all these great faithful uh, people before us. It says this, therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. It says that Jesus is the, the author and finisher of our faith. The word author can mean leader or, or pioneer. Um, and then finisher is the, the perfecter. And so Jesus, it, he, he pioneered the path of faith and he perfected the way of faith for us. And how do he do that? By keeping his eye on the joy that was set before him. It's, it's beyond the cross, right? It's beyond the immediate suffering that was going to be temporary. He's looking to the eternal glory, right? For that joy that was set before him. I think that's Jesus' point here, right? If you're only focused on these little things, it's going to be very hard for your sorrow to be replaced with joy. But if you're looking past those things to the eternal things, what's God going to accomplish through this suffering? What's he going to do through this ministry? How is he going to work through all these difficult things? It's the joy that's set before you because you know he's going to answer prayer because you're, you're faithfully praying that he will accomplish those things and not release you from the difficulties there, right? But he'll accomplish those things for you. While the disciples were promised to be hated by the world, to be persecuted by the world, while Jesus promised them that they'd experience sorrow and weeping, he also promises that they'll, that'll be temporary. And he promises that they'll have joy, joy to the fullness. 
Matthew's gospel ends with the words, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Jesus said that because he was sending the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit lives in you today. He's with you to the end of the age. Not temporarily, not going to take a holiday. He's with you. It's, it's we who take the holidays, if we're honest, right? You don't feel the presence of the Holy Spirit. It's not, it's not because he's gone somewhere. It's because we have. My encouragement to you today is to give him more of you. Be more faithful in prayer. Prayer for the eternal things. And what's he promise? Joy. Joy that even overcomes difficult sorrow and grief. Let me pray. God, thank you so much for your word today. I thank you for the promise of joy. Lord, amazing, amazing promise to give these disciples. We, we know by history that they gave their lives to this mission, that many of them died very painful deaths, yet we see them without fear. We see them boldly proclaiming your truth, boldly going where you've called them to go, even rejoicing when they were beaten because they were counted worthy of suffering for your name's sake. Lord, I want that joy. Lord, I can lump myself into the same group who, who struggle with prayer, who really struggle to pray for the right things, the eternal things, constantly, unendingly, like we see Paul do. Lord, I pray that we would be that kind of church, that we'd lift our eyes up past our own circumstances, our own issues, our own problems, and begin to pray for these eternal things. No, it doesn't mean we, we stop praying for um, those things, to stop praying for the physical uh, needs or the loved ones that we're praying for. Of course, we, we take all things to you. But if we're honest, what really makes up the most time of our prayer? I doubt it's the eternal things. I do pray. I'm challenged by it. I pray that as we see the promise of the Lord here, that full, fulfilled joy really comes when we see answered prayer. Lord, there's a great warning in James that says we ask um, and don't receive because we ask amiss, because we want to see answered prayer so we can spend it on on our own pleasures in some way. Lord, I pray that we wouldn't be those kind of people, that we pray faithfully and continually because we want to see you glorified. We love you. We thank you for this time in your word. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.